Well, we recently celebrated the, the Coptic New Year on September 11th, and as you can hear, the church is in a festive tune, um, and we remain in a festive tune uh, until the Feast of the Cross. Um, and the church kind of relishes in the fact that we have a new year and a new beginning. And the church is often called, uh, the, the Feast of the Nehruz is often called the Feast of the Martyrs. And so we think about the martyrs because our Coptic calendar starts um, on uh, the anniversary of Diocletian. And so we think about martyrdom a lot um, in the beginning of the year. And of course, St. John the Baptist is the quintessential martyr. And so the church reads about him today. Um, and I kind of want to talk a little bit about uh, him. It's just the very beginning of today's gospel. For I say to you, among those born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. Um, and that, that title kind of blows our mind. Of, 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 born, of those born of women, there is none greater than, than John the Baptist. And in the church, actually, he's the only person other than St. Mary and Jesus whose birthday we celebrate. Um, we only celebrate three birthdays, Christ's birthday, St. Mary's birthday, and St. John the Baptist's birthday, because the three of them, their birth directly led to the story of salvation um, for all of us. And even in the church, uh, you know, you'll, you'll hear the deacons when we uh, when we say litanies. Um, often we talk to, when we talk to the saints, we'll say pray to the Lord on our behalf. But when we get to St. John the Baptist, we'll say intercede on our behalf, which is uh, like a little bit of a higher rank. Um, and we'll say that to St. Mary and the angels and, and St. John the Baptist, only those three. Um, everyone else, they get a little bit lower uh, of, a, of, a, of, a, of an uh, intercession from us. And so the question is why? Why the big deal about St. John the Baptist? Um, we only hear about his ministry for six months. That's it. So six months, and if you count all the words he said, maybe a hundred words. And so you have this person who's sent as the forerunner to lead the way of Christ. He's only around for six months that we hear of. He says a hundred words. And yet we call, and yet Christ calls him the greatest among everyone. Um, and often we think about Saint John the Baptist's fiery spirit. He would stand up to the Pharisees and call them "you brood of vipers," and he would say these, you know, really harsh things and tough things. And he told the the king that he couldn't marry um, his his brother's wife, right? And he told off King Herod, which of course um, cost him his life, um, and he cut his head off. And so the question is, you know, he did some amazing things and said some amazing things. So is that really why we celebrate him now for those, those few words? And the question is, did we celebrate him for what he did, uh, for what he said, uh, or for who he was? And I want to kind of focus on the who he was part. Um, there's another um, story about him in the Gospel of John. And I want to read to you a piece of it. It said, after this, Jesus and his disciples went out where he spent some time with them and baptized. So Jesus and his disciples were baptizing. Now, John was also baptizing near there because there was plenty of water. And an argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew. And they came to John, so St. John the Baptist, and they said, Rabbi, the, the man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, look, he is baptizing and everyone is going to him. So they go up to John the Baptist and they say, look, everyone's going to Jesus now. They've left you. People, his line is longer than your line to get baptized. And as a person, you have to, you know, John the Baptist was a person and he had feelings and emotions and he had a bit of an ego. And I'm sure it kind of jolted him a little bit. You know, when, when someone comes to me and says, you know, you're a great guy, but Puna Daniel's much better looking than you are, I think, ah, I'm kind of stung. You know, or in my church, you know, they tell me, you know, Puna Krillis gives much better sermons than you get. Yeah, I know. And this guy knows how to fix a car and you don't. Yeah, that hurts too. And so sometimes in the service, people come up to us and they say, you know, that guy over there, that, that woman over there, she's, she's better than you are. And the ego in us moves a little bit. We don't like that. You know, when, when I tell my mom that I like someone else's macarona bechamel more than hers, 
it's over. You know, that's a bad day for me. So, and I don't do that again. So, um, every Macron Bechamel is nowhere nearly as good as yours. Right? So, that's our, our ego kind of kicking in a little bit. Um, and so, this, this line, everyone is going to him, it's got to sting a little bit. Any human being would be affected by this statement. And other than being true, it hurts, right? And sometimes we, we, the truth faces us and it hurts that someone is in a better position, that we're just not as good as a person as we thought we were. And sometimes we see the own ugly in ourselves and we don't like it. And so what does it hurt? What hurts when we get these little twinges of, of people talking to us? And to this, John replied perfectly. He said, a person can only receive what is given them from heaven. It's very nice. So he's basically saying, I don't have what he has. I only have what I have. And what I have, I was given. And so he was given something. And I was given something else. He was given a gift and I was given a different gift. And both of us were given the gift. And everything I have came from heaven. So everything we have is a gift. What a realization. And that's huge, right? Because it means I can take pride in nothing. There's nothing that I've done. There's nothing that I own. There's nothing that I have that wasn't given to me from above. And that, that helps me realize. Like, so what am I? I'm just dust. I'm just a bunch of dust. And God blew in my face and gave me everything. And, and sometimes we forget this. You know, I mean, you can imagine if I'm, if I'm standing here and, you know, Elon Musk walks up and says, here, can you hold this, you know, billion dollars for me? So I'm holding a billion dollars. He's like, you know, but I'm going to, you know, just hold it for like 15 minutes. And I hold the, 50, the billion dollars and then, and I walk around and say, hey guys, I'm a billionaire. Look at me. I'm a billionaire. No, you're not. You're just holding someone else's money, right? I mean, you're a fool, actually, right? Because he's going to ask you for the money back. And so sometimes we give, we're given this gift to hold for a few years, and we walk around showing everyone our gift, like, hey, look at me. It's like, that's not you. That's someone else's. And he's just asking you to hold it for a few years and, in fact, do something good with it. And so every gift we're given is meant for the glory of God. Every gift, everything we have is meant for the glory of God. Of God. But what about me? What about what do people think of me? What's my legacy? How do people remember me? How do people talk about me when I'm not there? What's my reputation in the community? Am I well known? Am I well received? Am I well regarded? And these are the this is the me part. This is the ego part. This is the self part that creeps in. I want to be known as somebody. I want to be heard and talked about as somebody. I want people to respect me. And so St. John's response to this is truly spectacular and one you've heard many times. He says, the bride belongs to the bridegroom. I don't even know what that means. What does that even mean? The bride belongs to the bridegroom. So they're telling him, look, his line's longer than your line. People are going to him. They're not going to you. And he says, everything comes from above and the bride belongs to the bridegroom. So let's kind of dissect this a little bit. Who's the bridegroom? It's Christ. And who's the bride? It's the people. It's us, the church. So Christ has the bride. She belongs to him. So can I be jealous? Can I attend my friend's wedding and wish that his wife was with me? Not if I'm a real friend. I can't look at someone else's wife and say, I wish she was with me. Because she's not mine. She's Christ's. And so he says, the friend of the bridegroom who stands by and listens for him rejoices greatly when he hears the bridegroom's voice. And so when people tempted John and they said, they're leaving you to go to him, his response is, they aren't mine. They are his. And so sometimes, you know, I have a question. Do people sometimes attack other people for their service in the church? Sure. Do people get jealous of other people's service in the church? Sure. Someone's got a nice voice. Someone's got a nice sermon. Someone's got a nice macrona bechamel. Whatever 
the case may be, right? People get jealous of other people for their service. Someone's got a good meeting that everyone's attending and they're not attending my meeting. And people remember their talks and not my talks. And so sometimes we forget that they're not mine. They're his. Even the people are his. He's the bridegroom. And we see this, right? Even when, when this beautiful woman, the sinful woman, dumped the spices on Christ, doing a really nice thing for a really nice purpose. What did Judas say? He attacked her. He attacked her for, for praising and, and dumping spices on Christ. He was he even thinking about Christ? No, he was thinking about himself. What about the money? What could I do with that money? And so even as she served Christ, he didn't like it. Do people still do that? Yeah, all the time. We see someone else serving Christ. We say, what about me? And so yet John the Baptist responded to these people with style and grace and perspective. And that's not an easy thing to do. It's not easy to give up your legacy, your thing, your reputation. And we find this in the workforce a lot, right? I'll be doing some work. And then some guy will come along and try to take credit for what I did. I'll have an idea. And someone will say, hey, we had this great idea. And then the boss goes, hey, great idea. And you look at him, you go, that was my idea. I did that work. Right? And we, again, we feel that twinge. We see it everywhere, not just in the church. We see it at work. We see it among our friends. You know, I'll tell a joke and everyone will laugh. And then I'll see my friend go tell the same joke to someone else and say, hey, let me tell you this joke. And then everyone laughs. I'm like, hey, that's my joke. I told you that joke. And so at the very end, St. John the Baptist hits them all with the, with the verse of verses, if you will. Seven words. If we live by these words, it solves really all our problems. It's kind of the summary of the entire Christian life. He says, he must increase and I must decrease. And if you only remember one thing from the sermon, remember, he must increase and I must decrease. And if we get this line and we live by it, there's nothing left. It's really everything in the Christian life. You don't need to learn a whole bunch of verses. You don't need to learn how to serve. You don't need to learn how to pray. You don't need to learn how to fast. You can learn to let him increase and us decrease. So in this very famous book called The Grain of Wheat, Father Matthew the Poor talks about this idea. He says, the grain of wheat falls, as Christ said, to the ground and dies. And when it dies, it produces fruit. And so he focuses on this, I must decrease part. And so the Lord wants us to destroy this old self, the part that falls and has to die. And the old self of man is the old Adam, lust, pride, false freedom. Our ego is our only concern. Our thoughts, our labors, our hatred, our grief, our joy, peace, fear, everything, right? These are the, this is the old man. This is the old self. And he and Father Matthew talks about how we need to destroy this old self in ourselves because the kingdom of God is inside us. And so the only thing stopping me from reflecting Christ is me, right? I just have to get out of the way. Less me, more him. The more I decrease, the more he increases. And so I'll read you a quote from his book because it's a very nice quote and I can't say it any better about this process of dying. He says, this is a very hard process. So God uses all possible measures, direct or indirect, to attack the self. He applies constant pressure, a pressure which never ceases, one that many of us feel. God could choose different means, but is content to act in this way. For he has one goal, to destroy man's pride and its power, and to break the bonds that imprison the spirit of the new man. The self is under siege within the body, seeking to avoid God's blows against it. It may appear at first to sicken, but then it recovers. So God constantly changes his means of attack. Do you see that? That part's really cool. At home, for example, he may use parents, brothers, sisters. At school or in the street, he may use one's friends. And if this means fails, he uses a person's boss or rivals or else his job and his reputation. If such methods also fail, he uses the power of natural creation, animals and insects, 
by inflicting weakness or illness. Finally, if all things fail, man is unfortunately delivered into the hands of Satan, who will humiliate him and apply such discipline as God in his love has not used. It's amazing. It's like God is using this relentless attack against ourselves. And even one of the things he says here that, that really struck me, he says, he uses animals and insects. And I thought to myself, what are the insects? Mosquitoes, right? This guy, he's in a monastery. We've all been to monasteries. Even the mosquitoes, Saint uh, Father Matthew the Poor thought to himself, God's using them to destroy the self, the, the, the part of me that wants to sleep, the part of me that wants to be comfortable. And so this is what St. Paul meant when he said, it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God because God uses all of these means to discipline us, to break that old man, to kill it. And even in this part, he says, sometimes the old man kind of, you know, pretends it's dead. It, it gets sick and it stops, but then it comes back. The ego comes back. And so he keeps changing his, his methods of, of, of attack. And so St. Paul also says, remember those earlier days when you endured in a great conflict of suffering? Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times, you stood side by side, by, uh, side by side with those who were so treated. And so what does this mean? This means that when we go into the hands of Christ, just like the five loaves and the two fish, when we go into the hands of Christ, what does Christ do? He breaks. And this is part of the Christian process. And it comes at us from all the angles, whether it be parents or siblings or brothers or sisters or husbands or wives or illness or work. He gives us these tribulations and these struggles and this reproach. And so when I hear about St. John the Baptist, I hear about a man who's dead, who died to this world, who that part of him, that ego part of him was already dead. And so when they pushed at him and they said, you know, the guy over there is baptizing more people than you are, he didn't even react. That part is, it's dead. It's like a cadaver that you poke with a needle. It doesn't move because it's dead. And so obedience for us becomes the veil under which we disappear. Obedience is the veil under which we disappear as, as ourselves. I'll, I'll tell you one last thing. Um, a few weeks ago, I watched a documentary on a, a Catholic nun named Sister Claire. And she's really quite amazing. I don't know if you've ever heard of her, Googled her. She's really quite something. She passed away in 2016 in an earthquake uh, in Mexico City, or in Ecuador, sorry. And her story is unique. She showed up on a pilgrimage trip to Spain to visit some convents on accident. And she showed up. She's a young teenager. She's from Ireland. She's got cigarettes. She's got alcohol. She's on this trip to visit. And she thought she was on a different trip. She thought she was on a party trip with her friends. It turns out it's a, a convent trip. But her obedience and surrender to God was stunning. Every morning, she'd take out a blank piece of paper and she said, God can ask me anything today. Whatever God wants, I'm going to do. And when you watch her video, you realize she didn't matter at all to herself. It didn't matter what she felt like. Sometimes it would show videos of her in extreme pain and you couldn't tell she was in extreme pain. Nothing she felt mattered. She would just do what was right and put a smile on her face. And that was her living sacrifice of herself. And she gave of herself so much to the point where she had nothing left to give. And she couldn't do things halfway. She was incapable of doing anything by parts. She kept nothing back. And she says, we have to be saints. It's all or nothing. We can't remain in mediocrity. We have to fight with all our strength against the obstacle that impedes us from growing. And this reminds me of the quote from St. John the Baptist, it's all or nothing. She continues, and I'll read you this quote. Sometimes it's easy to say, yes, I want Christ to enter in me, but this doesn't occur in five minutes. You can't just go in front of the tabernacle and say now, and it's done and over with, and he's there inside you. In my experience, it's a fairly painful process. In order for Christ to live in me, in order for him to dwell inside and take complete possession of my soul, he has to step on and crush the serpent, the old nature, 
my ego of Claire Crockett. That hurts a lot, a lot, sometimes a ton. He has to get rid of everything that isn't him. And there's a lot, by the way. And sometimes my despicable self runs after things that he is trying to get rid of, to get rid of my soul, my will, my likes, my attachments, my ideas, my plans. And that hurts. Even though I know it's for my own good, it stings. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that when I say, let me die so you can live, I'm just kidding. No, I'm serious when I say it. But please give me your strength, your grace, your love, your saints, your mother, your heart, so I can lose all fear and so I can open wide the doors to you. Wow. It can be nothing but joy. And this is the process when we go through this painful process, what comes out the other side is joy, pure joy. And that's how we know God has been successful at crushing the old man that's in us. She continues, what makes the Lord happy is when I let him save me. And my happiness is in the fact that God desires to save me. He does everything, moves everything, and permits everything in order to save me. Last week, I, uh, I was speaking with a mom and uh, her daughter's getting married. As you can imagine, those are not pleasant experiences all the time. Lots of strife around weddings, as you all know. And she was going through a lot of trials, a lot of difficulty. And she's no theologian. She's no spiritual teacher. She's no you know, Sunday school servant. But she summarized it to me perfectly. She said, I am struggling with myself. That's the battle I'm fighting right now. It's me against myself. And I told her, that's exactly right. That's the battle you're fighting. It's not against your son-in-law or your daughter or the in-laws or whatever. It's you against yourself. I have to disappear. I have to let Christ increase and I have to decrease. And so, again, I'll just end with this thought that Christ sent St. John the Baptist as the forerunner, the one who was meant to pave the way, the one who was meant to open the door for the salvation of the world. And he sent a person who said a hundred words and whose only life we only saw for six months. And really all he said was repent. But more importantly than what he said is who he was and what he was. It was a man, he was a man who clearly struggled against himself. He had disappear, disappeared under his obedience and he truly lived his own words he must increase and I must decrease. He had surrendered completely his life to God and glory be to God.